Since the 1930s, Palomar Observatory has been at the forefront of astronomy, one of the most prolific Earth-based observatories ever built and an incredible resource for discerning the mysteries of the cosmos. The observatory sits atop Palomar Mountain in California in the United States and is home to three active research telescopes, including the 200-inch Hale Telescope, which until 1993 was the largest effective telescope in the world. This episode, we got the chance to speak to astronomer and writer Linda Schweitzer, whose new book, Cosmic Odyssey, is a history of Palomar Observatory and a record of some of the incredible discoveries made there over the decades. I started off by asking Linda what kick-started her fascination with the night sky. One of the earliest memories I have uh, when I was just a few years old, I think, was dancing under a meteor shower. I think that's where my love of astronomy really began. Um, but it wasn't until I was perhaps nine years old that uh, my parents took me to the Griffith Observatory, which is this wonderful place with lots of exhibits, uh, telescopes. Um, and I just, it was just so delightful to look at these images and um, the models and how things moved. And this is the whole universe. My God, you know, this is what I want to study. Um, although I studied mathematics uh, first, my undergraduate degree, and then I switched to astronomy because it, it was a beautiful blend of art, which I was also interested in, uh, and chemistry and physics. And uh, I went to graduate school in uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, so while I was completing my uh, bachelor's degree in mathematics at UC Berkeley, uh, I worked for the American Society for Eastern Arts. Um, and I had the opportunity to create uh, about a dozen unique art posters to hang in the lobby of the San Francisco Opera House. So you can see that I always had this dual interest of the creative arts uh, and, and astronomy and science and mathematics. Um, and later, I, I was a swing shift data technician at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, was in graduate school, and as a postdoc, um, I published my work in 1987. And little was known about dark matter, uh, how far out it reached in galaxies, how general it was. So I studied pairs of galaxies that orbit one another, that is, they're gravitationally bound, because that's one way to measure their mass. So after a statistical and dynamical analysis of these pairs, um, I found that they had substantially more mass than was seen from their starlight. So that indicated that they had dark matter halos. And secondly, these halos seemed to reach out to large distances from the galaxies. So this was just a small stone in the mosaic of the growing picture of dark matter. Um, but then I published my results and devoted the next 15 years to raising our four daughters. Fifteen years later, I joined Carnegie Observatories in Southern California, working in external affairs, uh, reaching out to the public, uh, interacting with the press, writing uh, grants and things like that. And a few years later, the opportunity to came, uh, came up to take a coveted position teaching science writing at Caltech. So uh, I did individually tailored one-on-one -on -one sessions with the students uh, providing them with the tools to describe cutting-edge science for general audiences. And in doing that, I really developed a strong urge to write a book uh, that would be kind of in the same vein. And Palomar Observatory seemed a plum subject. Yeah, so what, um, in, in your opinion, makes Palomar Observatory so, so special? I just came up with this term yesterday. Um, because I've been saying it was at the right time, at the right place. Uh, and there's actually something else that comes in. There are actually three, thing, three things that were perfect with Palomar. So Palomar is a Goldilocks observatory. Ever since my graduate work, it had struck me how big a role Palomar had played in the development of 20th century astrophysics. Why? First, it was the right size to do series work. It was twice the diameter of the previous big telescope, which is the Mount Wilson Hooker 100 inch. And second, it was built at the right time to benefit from war technology uh, that enabled instruments to be built with infrared and radio detectors. And later it provided access to X-ray and gamma ray satellites. These opened up whole new windows on the universe. And thirdly, it was at the right place, uh, Southern California, 
uh, which at the time was undergoing a surge in scientific development. There was Caltech and Mount Wilson Observatory and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and they all contributed some pretty great scientists and instrument designers. Uh, JPL introduced CCDs to Palomar, and there was a genius at Caltech uh, who built instruments around them. And from a personal point of view, uh, working at both Caltech and Carnegie, I got to know some of the astronomers who made fundamental discoveries at Palomar, and I realized that, hey, I could interview them uh, to build the backstory. So it was not just the science results per se that interested me, but really how they came to be, how easy or difficult or unexpected it had been to make the discoveries and kind of an insider's view of how science is done behind the scenes, behind the final announcement of the discovery and the publicity that all goes with it. And I thought this would be a real contribution to the public's understanding of how science is done. Yeah, it's it's really interesting when you think about um, those those observatories like um, Palomar. I mean, it was it was sort of conceived in 1928, you know, in the depths of the depression. So it's sort of it must have just been such a such a huge undertaking at that time to to conceive of it and a really really ambitious project, wasn't it? Oh, very ambitious. Uh, nothing like this had ever been done in this in this magnitude. Um, such a mirror had never been cast. A 200 inch mirror. Uh, there was a lot of struggle over that, and there are books written just about the funding, design, and construction of Palomar. And to think that they did not have computers to design this thing, uh, they just had pencils and paper, uh, cardboard models, glass, uh, plastic models, celluloid models. They had to really overbuild it because they couldn't test it. Uh, they couldn't test it by computers or in actuality, so they overbuilt it, which was actually a great thing in the end because up to the present day, it can be loaded with heavy equipment, heavy instruments. Everything can hang off of that telescope and it can hold it. It's unique in that sense. Yeah, I suppose the, the other um, ambitious aspect of it is when you're building observatories like this on Earth, you always have to get away from the light pollution. So it's not like they could build it in kind of downtown Los Angeles and you know, um, you know, you know, take advantage of the transport infrastructure to to move parts. They had to build it away from the from the sort of bright brightness of of LA, mm-hmm. didn't they? Oh yes. Uh, the problem is that uh, when when they were ready to build Palomar, uh, they couldn't build it on Mount Wilson, which is close to Caltech. It's um, in the L- near the LA basin because the light was already coming up. So they moved further south to San Diego County. Uh, but really uh, there are, I guess, four main criteria for, for building for where to place a telescope. And one is uh, there have to be clear nights, plenty of clear nights with low humidity. Um, that's mostly found on coastal mountaintops. And uh, there has to be good seeing. Um, that is, the stellar images can't be too smeared out by the atmospheric turbulence. Of course, low light pollution, as you just mentioned, from the surrounding city lights, you want to watch out for that, kind of look into the future a bit. And also, it has to the location has to be accessible for infrastructure improvements, such as housing and power and water, transport of the massive structures that go into a telescope building, and of course, visits by astronomers. I, I suppose it's worth sort of uh, looking back to how it all began, because it was, um, at the time, it was, it was the, the, the 200 inch was, was, was the largest telescope in the world, wasn't it? Yes, for about 45 years. Yeah, it really ruled. Yeah. <laughs> so and it was all sort of the, the brainchild of... Um, George, George Hale, wasn't it? How, how did he sort of um, come? I suppose how, how did he come up with the funding, and and what what made him decide to what, what was what was his inspiration in, in in wanting to to build the the observatory? This was his fourth largest telescope in the world. So the first telescope he built, the largest telescope, was um, was built um, at Yerkes Observatory, um, which is in a in a bay near Bay. Uh, and the seeing was terrible, and the weather was terrible. And I think he, he regretted it. He, he came out to the West Coast, and he visited Lick Observatory. It's high on a mountain, clear weather. Uh, 
And he realized that if he wanted to build more telescopes, he'd have to come out west. So uh, he settled on Mount Wilson first, and he built two of the largest telescopes in the world uh, there. And then uh, he just had it in his bones. He wanted to understand the universe. His focus was on understanding the sun. He wanted to understand the structure and composition of stars. So he he built the Mount Wilson telescopes. The 100-inch, after a few years, could not reach as far as he needed to reach uh, in the universe to see fainter and fainter galaxies and understand the universe better. So he started um, getting the funding, looking for funding for the 200-inch telescope. And he was, he was really good at hobnobbing with, with the rich, which helped. And at the time he was looking for funding, uh, the Rockefeller founding, Foundation was looking for a place to spend some money. So, the, so they hooked up. It was very fortuitous. Um, and Hale started getting together a team uh, at Mount Wilson um, and Caltech uh, to build this extraordinarily large telescope. Unfortunately, he died 10 years before the telescope was finished. What, in your mind, are the, are the biggest discoveries that have been made at Palomar over the, over the decades? And um, I suppose, how, how has it contributed to our understanding of, of, the, of the evolution of the universe? So Palomar is, is known for its pursuit of cosmological parameters, uh, such as a cosmic distance scale, the universe's mass, and the curvature of space. Um, but there seems to be general agreement that the single most important discovery would be the nature of small, bright radio sources called quasars. These are solar system-sized objects at the centers of galaxies that are themselves billions of light years away. These tiny sources emit the same energy as trillions of stars. And understanding how such energy was generated led to the idea of supermassive black holes surrounded by swirling disks of infalling gas. Uh, Quasars are so luminous that they also act as searchlights into the far reaches of the universe illuminating the otherwise invisible gas that pervades the universe. So we first glimpsed the cosmic web. Uh, we could detect galaxies that we couldn't detect uh, in their own light because they're seen um, in absorption between the telescope and, and a quasar. It's a great flashlight shown towards the Earth from the far reaches of the universe. But despite that being regarded as a, as a single most important discovery, I think there are others of equal importance and that perhaps carry even more into research of current interest. And one of these would be the systematic search for supernovae or exploding stars, which started at Palomar before the 200 inch was finished and continues to this day. It was discovered early on that there are different types, spectral types of supernovae, And the types were intensely studied, and eventually the astronomical community ended up locking down one of them, uh, type 1a, as a razor-sharp precision tool for measuring cosmological distances. So in 2011, two teams won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the shocking discovery based on these supernovae that around 5 million years ago, the expansion of the universe switched from deceleration to acceleration. And the cause of the switch is still a mystery. And cosmologists have proposed the existence of a repulsive force, theoretical to explain it. So the search and study of supernovae, which lasted over the entire history of Palomar, I think is as important as the discovery of quasars. And then another discovery, all modern astrophysics depends on the understanding of how stars form and how they evolve and how they die. In its first decade, Palomar discovered how stars of various masses change as they age. And another discovery that stars produce radioactive elements with short decay times was a clue that most chemical elements are generated not in the Big Bang, as it was previously thought, but in stars. And sometimes stars die by exploding, and sometimes they merge. Sometimes they eject their outer layers and pollute the universe with a smog which eventually reforms into new stars and new planets and new life. So work at Palomar also transformed our view of galaxies from static, separate island universes to objects that evolve themselves by interacting with each other, by colliding, 
and merging. Uh, Palomar produced the first models of how our Milky Way galaxy assembled, um, which was replaced by a model where the Milky Way uh, was not an island universe, but there were actually, uh, it was partly formed by dwarf galaxies falling into it, spiraling around and falling into it. Brown dwarfs were discovered at Palomar, and it was shown that they are the missing link between stars and planets. They have atmospheres, they have weather, they're really fascinating objects. Comet Shoemaker-Levy was discovered at Palomar before it crashed into Jupiter. And uh, Mike Brown was involved in the uh, the finding of large pieces of outer solar system rubble that forced the reclassification of Pluto to dwarf planetary status. Yeah, it's incredible when you look back at um, those discoveries and they sort of stretch from the from the sort of distant cosmological to to you know um, discoveries within our within our within our near solar system. One of the interesting things you were saying there was about um, its contribution to our understanding of the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, not the kind of deceleration that you know. I was taught about when I was at school, um, because that that ultimately relates to dark energy, doesn't it? So it seems that like um, Palomar's had quite a quite a good uh, history of um, contributing to the, the, the theory of, of of dark energy. Palomar contributed uh, the means to to discover that that is these Type One A supernovae, which allowed us to to observe much further out in the universe with high precision to get the distances to these objects. Palomar's main contribution to that discovery of dark energy is uh, providing, as I said, the razor sharp tool, measuring tool to get highly accurate distances so that the very small deviations from from the uh, rate of expansion in the universe could be measured and they could uh, conclude that the universe was that the expansion of the universe was accelerating. It seems like it must have been quite difficult to um, fit, the, you know, such a sort of illustrious history um, in, into the one book. What, what, what was the writing process, and, and, and how did you, how did you sort of pick which, which discoveries to include, and did, did you have to discard any 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 major milestones in the in Palomar's history from from the book? It was not an easy process, and it was a very long process. It involved interviewing people who. Uh, had contributed to major discoveries, uh, lots of uh, reading in astrophysical journal, um, in books, uh, in papers, in um, symposia. And in the end, what I wanted to do was construct entire threads of research that lead to discovery as close to the beginning of Palomar as possible uh, up to the present. Sometimes that doesn't work. And these threads sometimes cross each other. Uh, They sometimes break. They sometimes have a gap. And there were discoveries that I might have wanted to put in the book or that I was researching, but they somehow deviated too far from a main track. I did not want to present the reader with so much extraneous material and a multitude of discoveries like a textbook so that they would be they, they wouldn't follow the thread. They wouldn't get the thrust of what was being done. You know, like, what's the beginning? What's your goal? Uh, how are we getting there? Do we ever get there? Are we stopped in the middle? So it, uh, I did have to throw things away. Like 80, 90% of what I, what I studied ended up on the cutting room floor, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, but I think that I feel satisfied that what I wrote are stories that can be followed in the sense of how did astronomers follow steps? How did they put one foot in front of the other? What did they do when they failed? Uh, What did they do when somebody else um, reached the end goal faster than they did? What did they do about their rivals and things like that? But just to make a story of it, but have it direct and compact enough so that that when you finish the book, you can say, yes, I can follow this thread all the way through. Instead of like a textbook where it's just out there and this is what happened. Mm, yeah, I, 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 I kind of got that with the, the interlinking of the different threads because you've you've, you've organized the book in terms of um, su- subjects, sort of like cosmological subjects. So it's, it's not it's not a sort of chronology, like a sort of historical chronology of, right, of the development. Right, it, yes. it's, it's actually separate. So I suppose in, in that way, it it's one of those books that you could easily sort of pick up and 
and look, look, look at the chapter on the Milky Way or, or you know, look, look at the chapter on stars, for example? Yes, yes, you could do that. Um, the, probably the first chapter um, and the second chapter set up a lot of terminology and uh, technique that are useful for, the, for understanding the rest of the book. But in general, you could move around in the book. And if you want to study uh, the solar system first, go ahead. I put the solar system last, partly because uh, when I was young and reading books on astronomy, they always discussed the solar system and the galaxies were always the very last chapter. So they would have 10 chapters on the solar system <laughs> and they would have one chapter on the good stuff, is, at least from my point of view. So I decided to put it kind of towards the end. Um, d- d- does the uh, solar system... Um is that one of your sort of particular interests as an astronomer? Does, does that kind of sort of interest you more than, you know, super galaxy clusters and supermassive black holes and things like that? No, actually, actually it doesn't. It's never been um, a focus of mine. I mean, it's, it's a great interest, but I've always loved studying this, the very distant galaxies. I, I think I read somewhere that you'd, you'd done, was it like a, a, a hundred interviews for the book? <laughs> Is that, is that true? I interviewed over 100 people for the book and many of them several times. Yeah. So it was extremely time intensive and yet it was incredibly rewarding on a personal and professional level. It was time intensive because each recorded interview hour takes at least two hours to transcribe. And I conducted hundreds of hours of interviews. It was rewarding because I got to interview not only some of the greatest astronomers and astrophysicists of the 20th century, some of whom have sadly passed away, but also many postdocs and grad students. When you read about a discovery in an article or paper, you're seeing the final polished product. Yet the process of scientific discovery is rarely so linear or clear. The interviews poignantly revealed to me how much emotion and creativity and logic played a role in these scientists' work. Interviewees would relive memories sometimes from many decades ago, with the same anger, excitement, or regret as they had experienced at the time. I tried to fold their passion into the narrative when possible. I also wanted to make sure that I represented the diverse group of people who shared a common purpose and without whom the whole enterprise would have fallen apart. So I interviewed the teams who run the telescope nightly and maintain the instruments. Uh, weaving facets of these interviews into the narrative allowed me to share the artistic and human aspects of discovery with the reader, which was very important to me. Did it sort of put put um, the, the history of Palomar um, within the context of, of American history for you? It, it, it must have been really sort of illuminating um, and maybe like instilling a sort of a sense of national pride in, in, in the fact that this is such a such a such an American institution? Oh, very much so. Uh, Palomar was on the news all the time. It was in, written up in, in Life magazine and um, Time magazine with the pictures of the great astronomers, sometimes with their families and observing. There were movies shown in the theaters, you know, little shorts that would be shown before the main feature. Yeah, there was a lot of, of pride over having built this telescope and how it was reaching into the depths of the universe. It was all very mysterious and romantic. Yeah, I think I'd um, read you describe it somewhere as sort of like the uh, Apollo missions of its day, you know, sort of um, doing 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 astronomy or, or space flight indeed that uh, had never been done before. Yes, it was as famous as the Apollo missions were at the time. And it was as, it was really the the Hubble telescope of the time, of its time. It was just the go-to telescope for astronomers. Every astronomer wanted to observe at Palomar. And, uh, and the public was just fascinated by everything that they discovered. The, the, they took, you know, lots of photographs there that were quite beautiful, and those photographs would be sold. You know, you could order them, and people would put them up. Uh, did you ever um, observe at Palomar? And um, if not, would you... Would you, would you like to, or would, would, would you have liked to? <laughs> so I haven't ever observed with my own program there. I've observed at uh, Southern Observatories when I was doing my thesis. I lived in Chile and observed at three Southern Observatories. But I've been there many times um, since moving back to the U.S. and back to the West Coast. 
um, I've gone up there to do to do interviews and just you know to to look at the place and check out the place and crawl all over it uh, as, as writing this book while I was writing this book. So I've been in the data room. Um, I've been there during the engineering runs where they're checking out the telescope. That's my favorite time because. As long as you tell them you're going to crawl inside the telescope, you're safe. If you don't tell them, you might suddenly have the telescope slew on you and you're thrown around. That must have been really cool, actually getting to visit there and, and, and kind of get a get a sense of it. Did, did you sort of get a, a sense of the history when you were when you were walking around? Oh yes, it's uh, it's very much uh, Art Deco. Uh, the building, the dome that that it's in, the monastery, everything is Art Deco. So you're kind of placed back into that. Uh, that time. Uh, and everything is just so massive. And the crew there keep it spotless and shining. It's like no other telescope in the world, no other observatory in the world. It's just the crew that works there has such a pride. But just just standing out in the dome in the dark, outside the data room, but right near the telescope, when it's humming and wearing and moving across the sky and the slit is open and you can see the stars, uh, it's just there's there's no feeling like it. You, you get the sense of long history and deep inquiries into the universe. It's a wonderful experience. And that inspired me while I was writing the book. Uh, sp- speaking of some of those um, uh, inquiries into the, the nature of, you know, the cosmos and um, some of those unanswered questions, just to finish, I was going to ask you, um, what what do you think are some of the sort of unanswered cosmological, cosmological questions that you might like to know the answer to if, if you know, you click your fingers and, and instantly know? My wish list centers around dark matter. About half a century ago at Palomar, astronomers first noticed gaseous filaments in the form of quasar absorption lines. Although we didn't realize it at the time, this was our first view of the cosmic web. Cosmologists' current models predict that underlying dark matter is what is pulling gas along as it slowly collapses into vast sheets, filamentary web-like structures, and knots. So how is it possible that in some regions the density of material gets so high that there are stars, galaxies, and even supermassive black holes already at high redshifts? How did they form so quickly? We simply don't understand how galaxy assembly begins and progresses in the early universe. The universe's entire history is recorded in the cosmic web. It's a source for the material that condenses into stars and galaxies, and it's a receptacle for the radiation and metal-enriched gas and dust that is ejected by these same stars and galaxies. Since intergalactic gas is very tenuous, Detecting it is at the very limit of current instrumentation. Especially direct images of the cosmic web are a challenge. Some especially creative teams of astronomers and instrument builders hope to image glowing gas streaming from the cosmic web into galaxies. While ultra-sensitive instruments are at various stages of design, testing, and commissioning at Palomar and elsewhere, they're still near the limit of feasibility. The history of astronomical instrumentation assures us, however, that it's only a matter of time until the splendor of the cosmic web is fully revealed. Okay, Linda, well, um, thanks very much for speaking to me today. And I also want to just say uh, good, good luck with the book and I hope it goes well. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing your, your thoughts on the history of Palomar. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Mm-hmm.